This is when you realize that you have a headset that's not working, you have to go to where the microphones are. <laughs> so if I appear to be up and down, it probably is true. How do you um, introduce a legend? How do, how do you introduce someone who, in 1968, before Stonewall, felt the call of God on his life to proclaim a gospel of liberation and inclusion for all of God's people? How do you introduce someone who, for the last almost 50 years, has led God's pilgrim people to the promised land? How do you introduce someone who has been not just a spiritual leader, but a mentor and a friend? How do you introduce someone who, for the last 10 years before coming to Dallas, I had the great opportunity of serving as his pastor, and who for two decades prior to that served as my pastor? How do you introduce someone like that? You don't. You just remember the words of Jesus when he said to Peter, on this rock I will build my church. And you give God thanks for the Peters in your life. <laughs> Reverend Troy Perry turned 77 just a couple of days ago and is still preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. For those of you who don't know the history of Cathedral of Hope, we were founded as the Metropolitan Community Church of Dallas. Four or five folks traveled to Los Angeles on two consecutive Sundays and found themselves at the Metropolitan Community Church of Los Angeles. And Troy turned to them both and said, there's going to be a great church in Dallas. And he wasn't wrong. There is a great church in Dallas. And whilst we might now be called Cathedral of Hope United Church of Christ, Metropolitan Community Churches is a part of our DNA, is a part of where we came from, and it is what has transformed the Church of Jesus. And so, without any further ado, it is an honor on this 47th anniversary, acknowledging our past, stepping into the present, and looking forward to a united relationship together. I welcome to this pulpit on this day, the Reverend Elder Dr. Troy D. Perry, founder of the Universal Fellowship of Metropolitan Community Churches. God bless you. If you love the Lord this morning, would you say amen? amen? I want to introduce you to the love of my life. I used to preach and I used to tell gay men, especially gay men, I would say, uh, you know, it is amazing. We all want Mr. Right in our lives, but most of us will settle for Mr. Right away. And I said... <laughs> Finally, I met the person that I fell in love with, not to take away from those earlier folks I dated and went with, but I am so glad to have with me here today Philip DeBleek, my partner of 32 years, my husband. Would you stand up, Philip? Let everybody meet you. Happy anniversary, Cathedral of Hope. 47 years you've ministered the gospel in this city and around the world. My mother came with me lots of times to Dallas. And when she was alive, the last time she came, she was with me at the old church on Ross Avenue. And Don Eastman, who was the pastor then, asked my mother to testify, as we call it, you know, in our Baptocostal background. And... <laughs> 
mother was from the Southern Baptist Church, and I really didn't know what she was going to say. My mother had the deepest Southern accent you've ever heard. Uh, it took three interpreters to get to American English <laughs> with her. But when she got up in the pulpit in the Dallas church here, she said, it is so good to be here in Dallas where nobody speaks with an accent like they do in California. And so today, I want to tell you, I'm thrilled to be with all of you. In the verses of Scripture earlier, Neil preached on the rock. And I want to talk about our Hebrew Scriptures this morning Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. Amen. And I want to tell you the short version of that, I always tell people, is that you will be a joy to the nations if you follow God. Amen. See, I've always believed in the joy of my salvation. Uh, I, I'm one of those people that I love my joy. When I met your pastor, as he said, he was 16 years old. And I'm telling you, <laughs> cutest little 16-year-old gay boy. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell the whole story. <laughs> it had nothing to do with me, amen. <laughs> but I, no, I'm not going to tell you what his pastor told me it was so funny. But I noticed him. He made sure I noticed him. He and another young person in the church strolled. They had uh, um, petals, flower petals, they threw in front of me as I came into church for a get-together. And I couldn't help it. I just died laughing. I, th I thought, oh, is this how the British do it? You know what I mean? <laughs> this is feeling all right. But I want to tell you, tell you a little bit about your pastor. Things you may not know about Neil. And this is all part of my scripture. <laughs> Your pastor loves justice. Amen. I have watched him stand up in our city. I watched him in Great Britain when he did it. And I thought, oh my God. Uh, I have, look at this, I don't believe this young man. Something else he did. He always wanted to feed the hungry. Jesus told us there was really very few things we had to do to, do, to be who we are to be. And that's to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and to visit those in prison. Amen. Your pastor started a feeding program in Bournemouth, England. And they got a little van, and they set up a stove, and they started fixing stews and soups, and they would go down to the areas of town where the homeless people were in Bournemouth, and they fed the hungry there. What happens? One day, some evangelical <laughs> city council member went nuts and said, they cannot do that. And they said, not only that, he said, the only reason they're doing that is they're trying to get those homeless people in bed. What an ugly thing to say. Well, Neil being Neil, he went to city council and he got up in front of them, and finally they said to him, you have to take out insurance of a million dollars on that van if you're going to feed people from it. And Neil being Neil went to prayer, and the next thing that happened was an automobile dealer in that city called and said, Reverend, I've been seeing you on television, reading about you in the paper and your feeding program. I'm going to put up the million dollars on the van so you can have and feed the sick. And then the Anglican bishop called him, said, I want you to move your van over on my grounds, right in front of the cathedral. Let them come in and try to arrest me. 
for you feeding the hungry. God moves when we move. Amen. God moves when we move. As many of you know, I started preaching when I was 13 years old. Had a conversion experience in the Pentecostal church. Oh my goodness, my aunts and uncles, they believed in getting saved, sanctified, and filled with the precious, sweet Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> Any former Pentecostals here, you know? Yes, you, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. And oh, my goodness gracious, I got saved and sanctified. I'd go to the altar. Now, that was the mourner's bench in the church of God. And you would go down and you would pray. And I would go down and pray, oh, God, please fill me with the Holy Ghost. Him, fill me, Lord. And my Aunt Sine told me one day, Troy Perry, you're doing it wrong. She says, you know, you don't beg God for a gift. You thank God for a gift. Just raise your hands and claim it right now. And the night that it was so funny, I had a brother behind me slapping me in the back, screaming, hold on, hold on, hold on. Had a sister in front of me screaming, let go, let go, and let go. And when I let go and hung on, I got it right then and there. Amen. My mother was a Baptist, and I'd been really converted in the Baptist church at age eight. Would you give the choir a great big hand this morning again? I'll tell you. <laughs> I did my profession of faith in the Billy Graham crusade. <laughs> and when I heard y'all sing that wonderful song this morning, I thought back to that. It was very interesting. I would go out to church on Saturday to the Seven Day Adventist because my best little boyfriend, we were nine years old, <laughs> he attended the Seven Day Adventist church. Sunday mornings, I would go to the Lakeview Baptist Church. That was my mother's church. Sunday night, I went to the Church of God in Tallahassee, Florida. That was my dad's family's church. I wanted to make everybody happy. Amen. You know, when you're in the South, you've got to do that sometimes. Amen. But I learned, and I'm thankful for what they taught me. And the good things they taught me, there were some bad things. But it's the good things you remember when you grow old. My love of Scripture comes from the Baptist Church and the Pentecostal Church and how thankful I am. I learned very quickly I once, you know, I used to sing that little Sunday school song when your children were over here. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. I went through puberty and they said, no, he doesn't. All at once, God couldn't love me anymore. I learned very quickly when I founded Metropolitan Community Church and I started preaching all over. <laughs> I learned one thing. If there's one thing Baptists hate more than queers, it's Pentecostals. <laughs> I can tell you right now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. When I was young, I danced in the spirit. I have neuropathy now, and I can't do that anymore, so you have to do it for me. But when I came out as a male, I did not know how to dance, really. And I knew my parents took me to a dance when I was young, to dances, but they were slow dances. And all at once, you know, the, the 70s, the 60s, and the 70s were different. All at once, it was everything from the twist, do you know what I mean? To, and I'm trying to think, how do I learn to dance? And finally, I went to this little dance school that taught people, adults, how to dance. And I took three lessons, you know, it was like $5 a lesson. And I went to the gay dance bar, and I, I thought, oh, my goodness gracious, let's see how I do it. I was scared to death. But I got up and I asked somebody to dance when we got on the floor and I started, you know, my remember my dance moves and I was just having the best time. And the next weekend I went to the same club and thought, I've got it down pat. Oh my God, I don't believe this. Uh, I can really do it. People are noticing me now. Here I am dancing away. 
Third week, now there was a young man that went to that bar, the most gorgeous African-American man, who I learned later uh, worked in show business in Hollywood and uh, in choreography. He taught it to the movie stars all, only I didn't know that. He was the dancer in the bar. Third time I went in, I'm out and I think I am Mr. Wonderful and almost I look up and he is looking at me and oh my God, I, my heart just went patter, patter, patter. I thought, oh my Lord, I said, I must be doing all right. I said, this good looking man is looking at me and he started dancing through the crowd. He's one of those people that danced alone a lot of times. He was so good and the crowd would just open up for him. He started dancing, dancing over to me and finally he reached me, leaned over and whispered my ear, you've been around too many Pentecostal churches. <laughs> Jesus said, I'll turn you a sorrow into joy. I want to tell you this morning, whatever you're going through or think you're going to go through or have been through, Jesus will turn your sorrow into joy. I want to witness to that this morning. When I started preaching, I preached everywhere I could. I went to my pastor at age 19 and sat and talked to him and tried to explain the funny feelings I was having. And after an hour, his eyes sort of lit up, and he said, oh, I know what you're trying to tell me. You just need to, need to marry a good woman that will take care of that problem. Well, I married his daughter. <laughs> really the truth. <laughs> We would go to the women's club in the little town of Lake Alfred, Florida, just an awful place, <laughs> where they warehouse women in their 80s and 90s and families didn't come to visit. It was just awful, like tar paper tops in the South at that time. My wife played the accordion, we sang, and I preached every Sunday in this little old folks home as they would call it today but it was just for women and it was always amazing to me there was a little woman there who she seemed to have a lot of joy and um, she would listen to me every Sunday preach my little bad sermon I'm sure I wasn't that good but God was teaching me and these women some of them were not religious and did not want me to come into their room, and that was all right. I learned real quickly, you don't do it if somebody doesn't want you to. But here was this little woman, and that Sunday morning, I don't know, I got carried away, and I just preached, preached. And we preachers know when we preach. And so I, I preached that morning, and we went into the little woman's room who, you know, was uh, so poorly and yet so had such joy. And all at once, as we're in the room, she thanked me for my sermon and my wife for singing, and she went to the bank. Now, some of you may remember the bank. If you came from a Pentecostal or Baptist church, the bank was your mother's bra. <laughs> Women carried their money in their bra. And this little woman my goodness gracious, pulled out what she had and uh, she immediately tried to give me a dollar bill. Now a dollar bill back then, 52 years ago, was worth still money. And I said to her, no ma'am, I can't accept your money. I'm not going to accept it. I knew this was a poor woman. Before I knew what had happened, she grabbed me by the tie. We Baptist preachers and Pentecostals used to preach in ties all the time in a suit. And she grabbed me by the tie and pulled me down in her face. And she said to me, Preacher, don't you try to cheat me out of a blessing. <laughs> Jesus said it right. God will turn your sorrow 
into joy. I've just come back from Cuba, and I was honored by Cenesex, which is the organization sponsored by the Socialist Government of Cuba for my work for human rights. Uh, it was very interesting. They honored me at the Karl Marx Theater in Havana, the largest venue in the country. I thought, oh, the FBI is going to love this when I get home. <laughs> We had over 5,000 people there. The theater seats 5,500, and they sold it out, but everybody didn't get there. But they had over five. Your pastor was there. Your pastor flew in to be with me. I asked him to. And I've got to tell you that it was amazing. Philip and I are sitting on the second roll of the theater. No interpreter. I don't speak Spanish and people are talking i'm not sure what's going on and it was amazing i found out later not only was mariela castro the daughter of the president who was a member of the national assembly of the republic of cuba who made the presentation uh, she's become a friend i met her two years before and uh, we have three mccs in cuba already and already upsetting people that are that were there, I want to tell you right now. <clears throat> no one asked to see my speech. They asked me to speak. The interpreter didn't sit until we got on the stage, another American. And I didn't know who they were going to pick to do it. And he is from Puerto Rico and a college professor. And you know what? I've learned over the years, no matter where I'm at, I'm not going to back away from being who I am. I'm not going to back away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was amazing to me, just incredible. But two years before that, oh, and we had the American ambassador, the gay French ambassador, of course, and <laughs> the Swiss ambassador and his wife, the Minister of Culture of the country, the Minister of Health, uh, just went through a list of people who came there to honor my work in human rights and in GLBTQ rights. Two years before, I went to the Little First Baptist Church of Matanzas, Cuba. And it was an amazing little service. Took me back to my childhood. They sing the same songs they did in the Baptist church when I was a kid. And here are these Baptist Cubans who are trying to be welcome and affirming, still Baptists. The pastor talked to me, and he said, uh, I said, tell me about the church. He said, well, the worst time. He said, I'm, I'm not, I remember it, but I wasn't clergy. I'm only 44 now. And he said, but in the 1960s, when the American embargo took place, we discovered one of the things we couldn't buy were Bibles. The U.S. embargo was so bad at that time, they wouldn't even permit Bibles to come into Cuba. And he said, we took the Bibles we had and we cut them up into the books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right on through. And he said, when someone came who wanted to become a Christian and a part of the church, we gave them Genesis first. And then they had to give it back to us. Then we gave them the book of Leviticus it was really, really rough, Reverend Perry. And when I met with the Minister of Religion of the country at the Communist Party headquarters, and I'll tell you, I've lived an interesting life. I want y'all to know this, amen. I have been around the world. But I believe I have to carry our liberation of the gospel, the liberation of our people, 
the liberation of our community no matter where we're at. I have been invited to the White House by three American presidents. I've never backed away from one if I got the opportunity to talk. The first time I went was with Jimmy Carter was president, with the first group of GLBT people. But I insisted to the group that sponsored it. I talked to Bruce Voller and Ginny Apuzo and others, and I said, I want a heterosexual mother there. I want to tell you, if we can get a heterosexual mother in the room who has a gay child, she will be a tiger. I want another emotional person beside Troy Perry in the room. <laughs> get me a mother. Bill Clinton was very good to me. He had named me as a delegate to the first White House conference on AIDS, first White House conference on hate crimes, invited me for breakfast with he and the vice president and 90 other clergy and honored us for our work in the American society. Philip and I received an invitation from President Obama for the 40th anniversary of Stonewall and we were invited to the White House and got to talk to he and Michelle Obama. What a wonderful time. But you know, I'm still a little Southern boy who dropped out of high school because Jesus was going to come any day. What did I need to know algebra for? <laughs> <laughs> Unaccredited Pentecostal school. When they threw me out for being gay, their parting words to me were, you're not worthy to be educated by Christians. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. <laughs> I'm dyslexic. My partner can tell you I can't spell, but I can talk. <laughs> because a seventh grade school teacher said to me, Troy Perry, for some reason you can't spell. It's in Mobile, Alabama. She said, learn to talk correctly. Thousands of people will hear your voice that will never see your handwriting. <laughs> and you know what? I have done that. And I've tried to follow the Lord, sometimes better than other times. Amen. Amen. We all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect, thank God. Jesus came to show us. I love that new commercial, you know, first class is to show you why you're not in first class. <laughs> Jesus came to show us we could go first class. And you've got to remember that. And so, this morning, I stand before you, a 77-year-old gay man who knows from that little Baptist church in Matanzas, their last little song they sang when they opened the doors for people to walk down the aisle like the Baptists do to accept Jesus as their Savior or to be baptized or to join the church. They sang that little hymn, Jesus Paid It All. All to Christ I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. Jesus washed it white as snow. And this morning I come to you as that 77-year-old man who knows Jesus paid it all. And therefore I want to ask forgiveness for my part in our separation and to all, to all of you that I may have offended in the Cathedral of Hope because I know Jesus still forgives our sins. Amen. Happy anniversary, Cathedral of Hope. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you.